there's something seriously wrong with Robot 908. At first, I thought it was just bad luck. The people were being careless. Now I don't know what to think. Sorry, I'm getting way ahead of myself. My name's Dave. I work at an auto parts manufacturer. I can't name the company, so I'll just call it Kressler. We create the various pieces that go into your car when it gets put together at the assembly plant. The only thing that's important when you work at Kressler is the daily quota. We're divided into teams and we're kept accountable for every other team member when it comes to production standards. And by standards, I mean getting everything done on time no matter what. There's no emphasis on safety or technical training, only on speed. And that means getting new people out onto the factory floor as quickly as possible with little to no safety education. When I told my brother Noel I wanted to work at Kressler, he said it was hell to avoid it at all costs, since he had worked there before and had been lucky to get out alive. Uh, but I needed a job, and he couldn't talk me out of it. He told me to be careful that there had been accidents and the company could cover them up, paying off the families so the media didn't catch a wind of what a death trap the place really was. My first week on the job, I almost died. I would have, too, if not for the fact that Danielle went to that cage instead. The robot I was responsible for, Robot 908, had suddenly stopped working, going dead in the middle of an operation. Even though she wasn't my manager or my supervisor, Danielle was on my team, and my robot's output was needed to maintain our group's quota for the day. Without it, we'd fall behind and wind up on the shit list. Management followed up rigorously with anyone who didn't meet quota, and that meant lost bonuses, lost hours, even dismissal if it happened frequently enough. Needless to say, we couldn't afford to let the robot stay inactive. Did you call maintenance? She asked, walking over to my station. Yeah, I left a message, but you know how it is when you leave a message. Keep calling. Gideon will have an embolism for short again. You're the new guy, right? Yeah, hey, I'm Dave. Danielle. Listen, we need to get this up and running again ASAP. What's the error? Compression fault in stem 6, I told her, and she shook her head, looking disappointed. No way to clear that without somebody going in there. That kind of error means something's come loose, needs a manual adjustment. Call maintenance again. Don't stop until they pick up the phone. Nodding, I went back to the landline phone at the main control module and entered the phone number for the maintenance office again. The phone rang and rang, but there was no answer. After nearly an hour had passed, we were getting frantic. The chance for making up lost time was dwindling, and if we didn't do something quick, we'd be in serious trouble. Maybe even fired. And I needed the job. I couldn't afford to lose it. I guess Danielle felt the same way. Watch my terminal, she said, adjusting her hard hat. I'm going in. Are you sure? I thought we're not supposed to... She ignored me and locked the cage door, and... The chain link gate was swinging open a second later. Closing it behind her, she looked around to see if anyone was watching, then stepped towards the robot. The caution signs stared ominously at me from the entrance as she did. Stop. Do not enter. Extreme risk of severe bodily harm and death. Authorized maintenance personnel only. I stepped back, watching as she approached the robot. It had a huge arm, was standing connected to a pedestal which was nearly ten feet tall. The whole thing was a monstrosity, towering much larger than any normal person. And Danielle was dwarfed by it as she approached. Be careful, this seems like a really bad idea. What's the error message again? She called out to me. Compression fault in stem six. I called back over the noise of machinery and robots whirring and welding all around us. Okay, I think I see it. I'm going to try something. 
She bent over with a screwdriver in her hand and began to tighten one of the connections. After barely touching the thing, it sprang to life, looking possessed. The massive robot arm had been mid-turn when it shut off, thus it resumed its motion and spun on its axis straight into Danielle with tremendous force. Its glowing welding rod drove straight through her eye, impaling her, then lifting her up off the ground and sent her spinning through the air. The huge machine picked up where it had previously left off, welding pieces of steel together with the white-hot welding rod driven through her skull. Each action glowed bright with extreme heat as she screamed, a high-pitched wail of agony as she did. Somehow she remained conscious and thrashing while this went on and on and on. After being dazed for a few seconds watching the horrific scene unfolding, I came to my senses enough to hit the emergency stop button. The only problem was it didn't do a damn thing. Robot 908 kept spinning around rapidly, executing each function seamlessly, welding and rotating, pistoning the giant arm up and down, and bringing Danielle with it for each agonizing moment while she kicked her legs and grasped desperately at the hot welding rod, burning her hands as she grasped the heated metal with bare palms sizzling and smoking. Help, get it off, get it off, she screamed again and again. I kept hitting the emergency stop button, but it did nothing, as if it wasn't even attached to the equipment. I'd find out later that management didn't care much for the emergency stop button, since they slowed down production. The other workers nearby didn't even turn from what they were doing to look. They were all too concerned about missing their own quotas. Worrying machinery and robot arms welding parts together covered the sound of Daniela screaming, drowning it in the cacophony of noise which surrounded us, undeterred. It was obvious this was not the first time such a tragic event had happened, and no one seemed to pay any mind. I could do nothing but watch as she was sent spinning through another cycle of operations, and saw her blood being sprayed over the factory floor soaking the machinery in the chain-link fence surrounding her in red. I looked up a moment later and realized I was somehow inside the cage with her. Mid-stride, I was approaching the mechanical beast, but I had no memory of entering that restricted area. I felt like I was in a dream, no longer in control of my own body. The huge steel arm swung around, aimed straight at my head. Danielle was still dangling from it, impaled through her eye with the welding rod. Her legs dangled and swung wildly as I jumped out of the way, barely avoiding an impact. Instead of following its normal routine, the arm was now swinging back repeatedly in my direction, attempting to thrash me to death as I barely dodged in time. My heart was hammering with fear as I tried desperately to grab hold of Danielle's legs, to pull her off the possessed machine but it was moving too fast. It came around unexpectedly, and I felt a powerful impact in my midsection as I went flying across the cage, slamming into the chain-link fence with a brutal collision that rattled my teeth and my gums. Finally, a maintenance man came towards the cage, walking at a leisurely pace, whistling a little tune to himself. He saw Danielle and her face impaled by the machine, saw me in there with her, bloodied and bruised, dodging the robotic arm like a matador, and didn't break his stride or hurry even one step faster. You two really shouldn't have gone in there, he said calmly as I watched him open the control panel with a key. Maintenance personnel only, don't you read the sign? My jaw was hanging down to his lack of concern or empathy, and... I couldn't believe his absolute calm as he reached inside the control module and fiddled with the switch marked emergency lockout. Danielle stopped screaming was now hanging limply from the giant robot arm as it continued its tasks, pretending to be just a normal robot once again. It abruptly stopped in the middle of a welding operation, pinning her against a piece of steel. Several men came out of nowhere dressed in dark vermilion-colored overalls. They opened the gate and went inside. 
beginning to clean up the scene all around me. The team worked quickly, not missing a beat as they tore Danielle down from the welding arm of the robot and put her in a black body bag, carting her off somewhere else. I didn't even see them check for a pulse. Then the rest of them were cleaning up the blood with buckets, mops, and squeegees. Moving quickly and not doing a very thorough job, I noticed. As if all they cared about was getting the machinery up and running as quickly as possible. Man, Robot 908 again, the maintenance guy standing next to me said. This one's been nothing but trouble, I'll tell you. Ever since it came to the factory. He dusted off his hands and I heard his radio crack to life. The sounds of screaming could be heard through the receiver. You better go up to the management office. They're going to want to talk to you. You'll have to sign an NDA, but don't worry. They'll make it worth your while. They always do. He winked and flashed me a grin with a gold incisor. Hurry up now. Don't want to keep them waiting. Time is money after all.